Good evening. Our numbers are a little smaller. Um, as you can see, we are sharing, sharing uh, as we move along. Uh, we're very, very pleased uh, this evening uh, to be launching a very important book. Uh, at the very beginning of the conference, conference, I mentioned that way back in 2007, 2008, uh, we held a two-site conference uh, with uh, the Institute for the Study of the Americas, Kate Quinn uh, and myself, and Rupert Lewis and Tony Boggs from the Center for Caribbean Thought. Uh, the first conference was held uh, in, in, um, in London, yeah. and the second conference was held at Mona uh, on black power in the Caribbean. Indeed, uh, it, it looked at black power further afield as well, uh, the, the London conference, in that we looked at um, uh, black power in the United States, and there were quite a few people. There's been a revival of historical studies of black power in the United States, and some of the people doing that were present at that conference. Uh, but it produced a remarkable series of, of papers, and um, Kate Quinn uh, edited a collection uh, which uh, is, is here with us today called Black Power in the Caribbean and it's very, very thing. Now the peculiarity of this uh, book is that we have four hard copies on sale but we also have information for you to get your copies on the internet so we're in the age of we're fully into the age of the internet. Four hard copies and you can, you can get a discount if you get information from Kate on the copy on the internet. It's a hardcover edition, and all of you scholars know that the first edition comes out hardcover, costs more. Later on, if they make enough money, they make a soft cover version. That's how, that's how um, the presses do it. Um, I am not going to speak uh, to the book, but I'm going to, we have with us um, uh, Professor Rupert, Professor Emeritus Rupert Lewis, my very dear friend and uh, colleague who uh, perhaps more than most has studied uh, the Black Power Movement and the period of radical politics of the 1960s and 70s in the Caribbean. Um, Rupert, uh, of course, we, you will know, has, is a Garvey scholar and has done significant work on uh, the history and politics of Marcus Garvey, uh, has played a a huge role in establishing Liberty Hall, which is a center for Garvey studies located in downtown Kingston. Um, in addition, Rupert's uh, book on uh, Walter Rodney is exceptional, and um, most people in this room, in this small group, will know that work. Uh, Rupert is also in the book. And uh, when I, I told him, Rupert, I want you to launch it, he says, is it appropriate for me to launch it if I'm also in it? And this is typical vintage rupee. Very modest, very careful about uh, questions of protocol. But I told him, there is no problem, Rupert. You can even speak about your own article. But <laughs> I suspect he may not, but I leave that up to him. Uh, so I want to present to you now um, my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Rupert Lewis, who is going to speak to Black Power in the Caribbean. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you all for staying for the launch of uh, the book edited by my colleague, Kate Quinn. I was reluctant to undertake this task. As Brian indicated, I'm a contributor to the volume. But Brian persuaded me, and when Kate asked what I was going to talk about, I said I would not talk about Jamaica, but comment on black power in some of the other territories. Let me congratulate Kate Quinn for spearheading the Black Power Project in collaboration with the Center for Caribbean Thought with two conferences in 2007, as Brian mentioned, at the University of London and at UWI Mona in 2008 then following through with commissioning volumes for this uh, collection and working very patiently with all the contributors, with all the editing and rewrites that we all had to do. 
As she indicates in her introduction, there is no Caribbean-wide analysis of the phenomenon of black power. The study of, uh, this study of Caribbean black power covers the years 1965 to 1975, and the contributors offer an analysis of black power in multi-ethnic societies. Therefore, it creates a more complex analysis than the kind of bipolar discussion you get with respect to the United States. This volume is divided into two parts. Part one is entitled Black Power in the Post-Independence Anglophone Caribbean. And in part two, there are essays on black power in colonial contexts. The essays cover black power in Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Guyana, Antigua, the Dutch Caribbean, Bermuda, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. The volume includes essays featuring the Bermudan Roosevelt Brown, a UC Kwana in his capacity as leader of ASCRIA, which is the African Society for Cultural Relations with Independent Africa in Ghana. Other personalities include Tim Hector of the Antigua Caribbean Liberation Movement, whose principal ideological guide was CLR James. Caribbean black power was in large measure an engagement with black Caribbean prime ministers, Eric Williams, Hugh Shearer, Errol Barrow, Forbes Burnham, as well as with British, American, and Dutch governments uh, who took the black power uprise, uh, uprisings very seriously. The essays by Quinn, Drayton, Richard Drayton, and Kito Swan drawn documents from the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, British and Foreign Commonwealth Office, British Intelligence Sources, Services, both MI5 and MI6, Cabinet documents, and other confidential sources. Quinn provides an analytical framework for assessing black power in her overview essay, with the emphasis on the challenge of the black power movement to the political legitimacy of regimes throughout the region. And I was struck um, by some of the papers presented, particularly today, because 40 years ago, people were saying very similar things, that conventional politics, Westminster is finished, uh, need a new era, and so on. Um, the volume enables one to understand that the Black Power Movement was a democratizing force as a result of organized and spontaneous mass action against discrimination in employment in banks and businesses and against poverty and cultural oppression. A 1971 study found that Trinidad's business elite were 53% white, 15% of white, and just 4% African. That's a study by Anton Camejo. The movement also challenged the colonial mindsets and ambivalence among the people that was reflected in the thinking of Caribbean political elites. The movement confronted the exclusive club of corporate elites in the early years of political independence. Black power therefore became a necessary part of decolonization in that it pushed the entire society as well as Caribbean and imperial elites beyond their own boundaries of power and control, at least for a time. And I'd like to emphasize this aspect of black power, not only in relation to the state, but in relationship to people at the community level, people on the corner, people in different organizations, the debates that took place, which are not adequately captured in the volume, relate a lot to what was happening on the ground with interpersonal and community relations. Quinn notes the heterogeneity of, heterogeneity of the movement uh, and quotes, Caribbean black power was not a singular ideology, but a heterogeneous movement that encompassed a, a range of convergent and divergent political positions and concerns, end quote. It was not possible to unify these disparate groups across the region, though a valiant effort was made by the Bermudan Roosevelt Brown in 1969, and it took place notwithstanding the restrictions on the movement of activists by several Caribbean regimes. 
Another meeting took place following upon the Bermudan meeting in 69, in 1970, in Rat Island, St. Lucia, which was organized by George Odlum. Um, I attended that meeting. Maurice Bishop was there, uh, Trevor Monroe, and many others. The Rat Island meeting was followed by another meeting in Barbados in 1970-71, organized by Bobby Clark. So efforts were made to link activities and to discuss future prospects in the region. Trinidad had by far the most important black power movement, and Selwyn Ryan has edited a collection and written on this period. It took the form of the February Revolution that animated the population and nearly brought down the government of Eric Williams. Brinsley Samaru's essays captures the key events and issues. NDRAC National Joint Action Committee was a leading organization and was founded in response to solidarity with the protests by West Indian students against a racist professor at Sir George Williams University in Canada. Protests there had turned violent when the students burnt down the computer center and were arrested. This ignited future fury among students at St. Augustine, UWI. NDRAC led demonstrations in support of the, can the Canada-based uh, students. NDRAC also organized significant marches, including two to Karuni to meet with Indian sugar workers. Williams secured the cooperation of Bades Maharaj, his political enemy, to stop Indian participation in the marches. Efforts were made by NDRAC to build links with the oil field workers. And Williams faced further trouble with a mutiny in the army by young officers. In response to the army mutiny, Williams accessed arms from the United States and Venezuela and also sought help from Jamaica and Ghana. The majority of Forbes Burnham cabinet members opposed assistance to Williams. Eric Williams locked up activists and banned activists from other territories, among many Walter Rodney, Bill Revere of Dominica, Norman Gervon come, uh, come to mind. Uh, William sent out Gervon shortly before the um, ban on uh, Walter Rodney in Jamaica. State violence was therefore a central part of Williams's response, including a state of emergency, in fact, more than one. The formation of NUF, National Union of Freedom Fighters, marked a new stage, responding to the repression of the Williams regime. Nuff decided on armed struggle, which resulted in the killing of 18 of their mem numbers and three police officers. And Brian has written uh, work on the Nuff and that period in Trinidad. Nevertheless, the essay by Samaru argues that the demonstrations allowed Williams to introduce a series of economic, social, and cultural reforms. Uh, the impression I get from the Samaru essay is that Williams had, was working with two sets of people. His cabinet was definitely for repression, whilst a group of people who were PNM supporters and who were moving in the demonstrators, were ab among the demonstrators, were able to collect leaflets, pamphlets, identify people, see who could be brought to support uh, Williams, the PNM and so on. So Williams was operating on both the informal level as well as the formal level. In other territories, violence was also deployed by the authorities. British troops were sent to Bermuda on four occasions from 1968 to 1977. The British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, British Security Service, MI5 again, and MI, Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, worked on getting information on the operation and finances of black power organization, advocates and activities in the Caribbean and the United States. FBI and British officials created a stop list of Caribbean activists, among whom was people like Trevor Monroe. And President Nixon called for an investigation into the connection between black power in the United States and the Caribbean, a document um, that was cheered by Richard Hems. The Americans and the British and British intelligence, quote, recognized that conditions in the Caribbean 
played a part in stimulating the growth of black power. The British conceding that the inequalities, I quote, the inequalities of social and economic standards gave much scope for agitators in several Caribbean countries. The Americans noted that popular agreements were often real and compelling, end quote. For instance, Barbados had a segregation that existed in all Caribbean territories with exclusive yacht clubs, discrimination against locals in hotels, even in churches where certain pews were reserved for white people, and where some schools had exclusively white and light-skinned students and staff. In one of the intelligence reports, the British High Commissioner to Barbados wrote in 1971, and I quote, more and more of the old white Barbadian commercial families are coming to accept, however reluctantly, that their economic future depends on their ability to accept the realities of the present and to forget the pe pleasant past in which the black man accepted his subordinate status. The perceptible progress in Barbados is probably in some part due to the Trinidad troubles which have brought home to the white Barbadian populations, a population, the problems they will face if they are unwilling to come to terms with the aspirations of the large majority of the population, unquote. This assessment is relevant to other Caribbean countries as political leaders responded to the movements in their own territories and coordinated intelligence operations to obstruct regional links. But they also had to make concessions on economic and social issues, embracing moderate expressions of black power. Many were pushed in directions they had not considered. Richard Drayton points out that by 1971, Barbados' relations with Britain went into crisis. In June 25th, on June 25, 1971, Barrow called a press conference at which he accused the United States and the United Kingdom of meddling in the affairs of Barbados and said, quote, if evidence of further meddling arose, he would take steps to ask for the peaceful withdrawal of the citizens of the country in question. He then turned down a seven million US dollar loan uh, from the United States because the terms attached smacked in his words of imperialism and neo or neocolonialism. Uh, when you read uh, Richard Drayton's essay, the stereotype of Barbados as a conservative place is um, undermined. Uh, Barbados does have quite a tradition uh, of radicalism, certainly from the 30s through to the Barra period, with the exception of the Grantley Adams period, where Grantley Adams is quite definitely a Cold War warrior firmly in the, um, the British uh, camp. Another consequence of this period which uh, is brought out in the essays, uh, in 1972, Manley, Burnham, Eric Williams, and Barrow opened diplomatic relations with Cuba in defiance of both the United States and the Organization of American States. Burnham went furthest in his response to the black power situation with bauxite nationalization, the declaration of his cooperative socialism, and a radicalized foreign policy which included support for armed movements in Africa and later, later the arming of the New Drill movement in Grenada in the period when they were organizing the overthrow of Gary. Uh, the USCIA report also notes that Burnham provided uh, asylum, asylum to the largest number of African American exiles. Black power was transnational and influences, the influences went back and forth between the United States and the Caribbean. Some have seen black power as being wholly derivative of the United States, but readers of this text will leave with a better understanding of the regional emergence and development of the movement and its relations with U.S. activists. The essays on the free beach movement uh, in the Virgin Islands, American Virgin Islands, 
and the Black Power Revolt in Wilhelmstad, Curacao in 1969 offer perspectives outside of the better known Anglophone Black Power activities. The volume ends with a brief sum summation by Brian Meeks of the text and uh, of essays and a personal essay by him on his own sojourn in the black power and Marxist activities in the region. This extends in Brian's case through to his experiences in 1917 Trinidad, Jamaica in the 70s, Grenada in the early 80s. Although to conclude gains have been made as a result of the black power uh, demonstrations uprising, activities, protests. The issues raised in the popular movement of the 1960s and 1970s are still mainly with us today. So thanks, Kate, for providing a framework within which to appreciate a moment of significant challenge, violent in some cases, to the newly independent regimes. Uh, in the Caribbean and to encourage more work to be done on the Caribbean because the book as broad its, as its scope is doesn't cover all the territories in the region that were affected by the movement of black power. Thank you. Thanks uh, Rupert and I'm going to ask Kit to reply, but since uh, Kate gave me such a long introduction, I'm going to give her an introduction too. Kate Quinn is lecturer in Caribbean history at University College, College London. She's editor of this, not only this uh, new publication on black power, but co-editor of Politics and Power in Haiti, Paul Grave Macmillan, 2013. She has also published articles and book chapters on the political and intellectual history of revolutionary Cuba, post-independence Trinidad and Guyana and the Burnham. She was chair of the Society for Caribbean Studies from 2012 to 14, and is currently chair of the Haiti Support Group. She's principal investigator on the AHRC-funded International Research Network on Westminster and the Caribbean history, legacies, and challenges, of which this is the final activity. Kate. Thank you both. Um, I want to thank Brian again and Yui for the opportunity to launch the book here. Um, it's a great privilege to launch the book on the Mona campus, which of course holds such a central place in the history of the Caribbean Black Power Movement. Um, and it's also an honor and uh, not a little bit scary to launch the book in front of many of those who've not only written about uh, the history of this period, but who themselves also lived it on the front line. Um, I also want to thank Rupert for his comments and also for his role along with Professor Meeks and Professor Tony Bogues um, in the genesis of this book which couldn't have happened without their generous support and patience over the last uh, seven years since the original conferences on which the book uh, w uh, emerged uh, uh, took place. It's been a labor of love and um, uh, you always think about the things that you wish to have included in it as well, but uh, for all the uh, things that we didn't manage to cover, I'm, I'm very happy to finally see it out in print. Um, I'll just say a few words about how the book was developed and what it seeks to do. I, I don't think I need to, to add to, to, to Rupert's comments. He's made uh, a summary um, that, I, that I won't add to, um, and I also don't want to stand too long between you and the, the cocktails that await us at the end of this conference. Um, both Brian and Rupert mentioned the conferences on which the, uh, uh, that, that uh, inspired the book. The, the theme of these conferences was internationalizing black power, and um, as the title suggests, they sought to consider black power more broadly, um, looking at it in international and comparative perspective. So um, bringing together papers on North America, the Caribbean, Africa, Latin America and the UK, the conferences tried to gain a, a fuller understanding of the global context in which black power emerged, the transnational dimensions of the black power phenomenon and the existence of and interactions between um, parallel and related movements outside of the United States. Um, but at these conferences, it was evident that there were um, significant gaps and unevenness in the narrative of global black power. Um, one issue is that scholarship on black power has, for obvious reasons, been dominated by the story of the United States. 
Um, as Brian mentioned, um, the last decade or so has seen a plethora of new works um, on black power in the US being published. Um, these have performed very important work of um, historical revisionism and recovery and have brought um, significant new insights to the analysis of the US movement. Many of these works have um, criticized the narrow domestic lens through which US black power has been viewed and have called for greater attention to the international and transnational dimensions of black power. However, um, more often than not, this um, international perspective has really served as a means to better understand the US movement and how it was affected by engagement with uh, the outside world, rather than examining parallel and even related movements elsewhere. Um, that's to say, scholarship on black power in international context tends to look at how international events or the international travels of its progenitors um, influenced the US movement. Um, there has been much less awareness on the US side, at least, um, of other movements, even when, as is the case with the Caribbean movement, there were some significant connections between um, activists in the Caribbean and their counterparts in the US. Um, so this, the um, US centrism maybe of the scholarship, is one of the issues that the, the book responds to. From a Caribbean perspective, another issue raised at the conferences was a perception of a general lack of public awareness, particularly among the younger generation, about this important period of Caribbean history. At another conference on black power, which was this time um, organized by the history department at UE St. Augustine um, in 2010, many of the conference participants voiced their despair about how little public information and knowledge there was on Caribbean black power um, again, talking mainly about for the younger generation who were studying on the campus, the, the very campus where the, the sparks of Trinidadian Black Power uh, was it, were ignited. Um, and there was a feeling that uh, uh, Black Power was still viewed with some degree of suspicion and even hostility. So this conference ended with an urgent plea for the preservation of this history, um, much of which remains to be recuperated through oral histories of its participants, and through the invaluable personal archives that um, may be lying unused in people's homes. Uh, a third issue to which the book responds is the gap in the regional narrative of Caribbean black power. As might be expected, much of the scholarship on black power in the Caribbean has focused mainly on Jamaica and Trinidad as the sites of major black power protests in 1968 and 1970. Um, but has, as Rupert has um, just discussed, engagement with and mobilization around black power was not confined to these two states, but was a truly regional phenomenon, with black power organizations emerging in Antigua, Belize, Bermuda, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, the US Virgin Islands, to name uh, some examples. And while organized black power was mainly to be found in the English-speaking territories, exposure to the ideological currents of black power was region-wide. Even in the Hispanic Caribbean, where black mobilization had historically been channeled into other um, political and cultural affiliations, the relevance of black power was debated, not least in revolutionary Cuba, which famously hosted um, prominent figures of the US movement, um, and which also provided inspiration to some in the Caribbean movement, um, some of whom, like Walter Rodney, Rafik Shah, and Clive Nunes, um, traveled to Cuba to see the revolution for themselves. This book then um, responds to some of these imperatives. It represents a modest contribution towards an expanded regional analysis of Caribbean black power that can also contribute to the wider global story of black internationalism in the period. And this Caribbean story has much to add to our understanding of the meaning of black power in different contexts and the extent to which the concept had resonance outside the United States. Um, as Rupert has outlined, it focused on the, the so-called classic period of black power, the 1960s and 1970s, um, offers an overview of the Caribbean uh, uh, movement, um, outlines a particular national and international context in which it emerged, its local meanings and manifestations, and its relations with the movement in the United States. The book asks a number of questions. Um, what did black power mean in the Caribbean context? and what were the um, internal differences between conceptions of black power within the region as well as um, uh, differences between the region and the United States. 
what were its principal concerns, achievements and limitations? How did Caribbean governments respond to the perceived threat of black power and what impact did it have on domestic and regional politics? What are the legacies of black power and what lessons, if any, does its theorization of Caribbean societies hold for the present day? In responding to some of these questions, um, the book certainly doesn't claim to offer uh, the last word, but rather a jumping off point. The field is wide open and there is plenty of scope for a black power in the Caribbean volume two, volume three and so on that might address some of the topics uh, that for logistical and other reasons unfortunately couldn't make it into this book. As I hope the book shows, um, the nature, the significance and the legacies of Caribbean black power offer a rich mine of research, much of which remains to be explored. And uh, I hope that the book can inspire others to take up the challenge. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kate. And so, formal line to buy the book, and um, don't um, rush the stage. Um, and once you've bought it, uh, you can go outside, and we should have drinks outside. You have to buy to get drinks. No, actually, no. You can get the drinks. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, I think when it's one of those things where when you come up, they tell you how much it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you, you want to ask a quick question? Yes. Sir. Okay, sure. Go ahead. I, I, yeah. um, you just ended with uh, one of the uh, several questions, and one was uh, what lessons that does black nationalism hold for today? And I have two major issues that have been serving me for the past hours. Okay, okay. What I'm going to ask you is, is really, uh, can um, you make it I very short? Well, okay, okay, I will summarize it. Sure. Um, when you talk about black nationalism and black power, we speak about group economics as well. Which is why I have a problem with the fact that the book is published at the University Press of Florida, which is a white-owned business. Um, you could have published it at, for example, Iron Randall, which is a black-owned business. I checked it on Google. Um, University Press of Florida asked for a very high price. Now it is 30 US dollar, but normally online is 60. Together with the transportation cost makes it very unaffordable for a lot of people here. Um, who might be interested in it. Second, the white transportation business is also white owned, and they don't do promotion, which is why you only have four books here, while well, Iron Randall, as you have seen today and yesterday, do a lot of promotion and sales, and do it for a lower price. Secondly, which is my bigger problem, is that you told me earlier today, with all respect, that one of the authors in the book is Mr. Gert Osin. His title is professor, but he doesn't deserve it. Because he's from my country, the Netherlands, and he's one of the most racist people I have ever read a book from. Also, everybody in the uh, racial justice network in the Netherlands, of which I remember, gets furious from hearing his name. For example, he has written in one of his Dutch language, uh, Dutch language books, The Paal and the Crown, which means the pearl and the crown. He wrote the literal sentence that um, the slaves, he doesn't use the word enslaved, he used the word slaves. He said that they were branded with hot iron twice. Once when they, boarded, when they were boarding the slave ship in West Africa, and once when they were sold to their owners in the Caribbean. This is how, and this is what he this really says, this is how the slaves knew that the owner would take good care of them. Branding with hot iron. <laughs> Secondly, he said, for example, about the earthquake in Haiti, that Haiti would have been better off if it had not revolted in the beginning of the 19th century, because then the country would have been more wealthy and everything because of the French care. Oh yes, French take su got such good care of their colony. So he is one of the most racist people in Dutch academia. So I do not think that he deserves a place in the book amongst respected people like you, Professor Lewis, and others in the book. Um, I have more, but let me be okay. And for problem two and three, I hope you can take these comments into account. Thank, <laughs> Thank you for your comment. I will speak, hopefully, for Kate. Uh, you know, university publishing is a difficult business. Uh, the University Press of Florida is a recognized press. Uh, there's a long history with the academy. Your point is taken and heard. But uh, these things um, are a little more complex than that. But also, I think your point about publishing with local publishers is well taken. Uh, in relation to a member of the 
volume. I, I, know, I certainly know your point very well. I'm sure Kate does. And we'll take it into consideration. But thanks for your comment. Okay, I think that's the end of the conference. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>